Hello and welcome to yet another video. This is the seventh episode in which the Hokage and the ANBU commander observe Naruto's use of shadow clones that night. The commander recruits the newly graduated Naruto for his forces by guilt-tripping the Hokage. Join Naruto as he becomes Team Ro's fourth member and discover what this means for Naruto's plot. This story is from Theraku260, please support her. Please like and subscribe to show your support. Let's get the show started. Orochimaru screamed in agony, the burns eating into his very chakra network, the wounds and the poisons killing him. His hands lay utterly devoid of their chakra network, making his body switch impossible with the other injuries. If only Kabuto was here. Too bad he wasn't at his base where the samples of his medic lay ready for him to resurrect. Even then, the medic might not be enough. He needed Tsunade. And now. Get the rest of your worthless team together, Kimamaro, we have a little road trip. The Sanin hissed before downing several medications. They would only slow down the inevitable, but it would hopefully be enough. Now, with Naruto. Naruto looked at the night sky from his perch on one of the Land of Fire's many trees. Angel chewed on some fish cakes they purchased in the last town. The ANBU in disguise felt naked without his face mask, but the urgency of tracking Tsunade-sama down made even mental complaints scarce. Naruto, will everyone be okay? Angel asked for the fifteenth time, his anxiety was getting to her, it seemed. I dot honestly don't know Angel. It's been three days and we've been led in circles, Tsunade-sama is elusive, but the gambling competition in Tenzaku quarters might be enough to hold her until we arrive. Naruto tried to sound somewhat optimistic but was failing. Angel decided to drop the pestering and jumped up to rest in her partner's now messy brown hair, being able to henge, really a shape shift, into anything or anyone made being inconspicuous a piece of cake, especially as detecting something like changing his hair was nigh impossible with the young ANBU's skill. Getting to Tsunade in order to deliver her orders would be a piece of cake. It was the, convincing, the, th slug Sanin, to follow them that sent shivers through Naruto's still tired body. With a final sigh, Naruto packed up the rest of his food and straightened his tattered cloak, they had eighteen hours to make it to Tenzaku quarters for the start of the gambling championships. Hours later and the cloudy night ended up forcing Naruto to channel Kurama's eyes, red slits illuminating the forest. Even with Kurama still sleeping, Naruto had access to the minuscule amounts of chakra needed for the eyes and the extra night vision they gave. Angel snickered. What? He growled, keeping his guard up for any attacks. The hellcat flicked her tail in amusement, jumping beside him in the trees. I'm just remembering what Gunma said about how your red eyes gave him the heebie-jeebies ever since you used them in that mission. Hmm. Which mission, I've had to endure him and Hei 8 on several missions unfortunately. He groused. Oh, just the one you had to be a little noble girl. Angel said. Naruto choked on air, hating that mission. That bastard, he promised never to talk about that, they all did. Sure, he looked epic when he killed those Suna Nins after the th sleepover part of the mission and made Kanoha gain a long-time employer with the shipping tycoon, but the teasing Hiate squad gave him for having to be and act like a princess always grated on his nerves. Being a proper young lady would never be one of his life goals. Unfortunately, everyone found amusement in that mission, namely Hikaru who still had photos, which Naruto blackmailed him into not spreading, and his adorable feline partner. Is it true that you fought three perverts in your kimono and flashed them to get an upper hand? Angel asked excitedly. Naruto balked. W what? Where the hell did you hear that? Oh, the Chunin Gossip Club of course. Angel said, looking pleased. You know, sometimes I worry about your intelligence. With Hikaru. The young Hyuga prodigy that nobody recognized paced the border restlessly, be a Kugan active. So far not one hint of Orochimaru not that he really expected any, but still, nor his subordinates. 
The original plan for Kanoha was to launch a war party on Oto and Suna almost immediately following the invasion, especially since they had no Jinchuriki, but with Hokage-sama incapacitated and the daimyo wanting to play it safe until his old friend's fate was decided, Hikaru was stuck waiting and playing cleanup. It pissed him off to no end. Orochimaru being alive altered many plans, and now Naruto was more than likely racing the snake freak to find Tsunade-sama, someone who might not even be able to help. No, stop thinking that Hikaru. You're supposed to be the positive and easygoing one of the squad, keep your spirits up. Hikaru mentally berated himself. But, how could he still be so happy with him separated from his team, some of whom were fighting for their lives? Taicho, our replacements have arrived, Hana interrupted his thoughts. She held out a scroll from the village, ready for him to read. With a dutiful nod the Hyuga opened it, eyes widening at the content after he deciphered it. Emergency Squad Sea Captain, Wolf Mission, Tracking and Elimination of Key Locations Within Odogekir Location, Land of Rice Rank, High A, Low S Details, Intel from Jiraiya-sama says the snake is out of the nest, leaving many key locations unprotected. Enclosed is a map with generalized locations of two bases. Seek and destroy these locations while the numbers of surviving Odo personnel are within double digits. Additionally operatives are implored to stop by the daimyo's palace to put it under new management without implicating Kanoha or her allies. Time range, two weeks or when the two bases are destroyed and the visit to the daimyo's place is complete, whichever occurs first. Note, survival comes first in this mission, and if bases prove too well protected, operatives are ordered to return may the will of fire guide your steps. Attached was a scroll with the necessary seals, bandit clothes, and supplies. Hikaru had a giddy feeling in his bones, finally feeling useful. Sure his team of trackers was not perfectly ideal for if something went wrong and they were tired, but... Hikaru ignored it. If they succeeded, they'd have put another dent into Orochimaru's home and taken out the daimyo. That part of the mission was obviously tacked on by Dragon-sama seeing as it was written in his personal code, not the ones the elders would know. Clearly his commander wanted the daimyo that sided with Orochimaru dead. Hikaru was glad, he remembered from the briefings before the invasion about how the current daimyo was technically a fraud, as he was merely the former attendant of the actual daimyo who was under Kanoha protection until he could reclaim his throne seeing as the attendant sent fifteen assassins after the young noble. Looks like claiming the throne was happening sooner rather than later. Hikaru had a hidden grin, ANBU masks really were the best and clapped Hana on the back. Okay Hana-chan, go get the rest of our posse together, Team Awesome has a teeny tiny mission. He cheered and went to burn the scroll, couldn't have anyone find out about his fun vacation in Odo, could he? Back with Naruto. Hey, Angel. Yes, Naruto. She yawned, the early morning hours making her sleepy even as Naruto kept on running towards their target, carrying her. What did you do during the invasion? He had already told her about his part, but Angel had been surprisingly silent about her ordeals. You know I don't want to talk about it, she snapped. Yes, and you know bottling it up will do no good talk to me angel, we don't keep secrets between us. He pointed out. The hell cat sighed, and began murmuring. Shame rolled over her, and Naruto didn't get why, until she began. Flashback, with Angel in the invasion. Angel had originally been with Habiki and his assassination squad due to some last-minute switch-ups. They were in charge of taking out the minions as they crept through the shadows towards the mountains, where the civilian shelters were. Angel herself had already bitten off the head of ten shinobi and barbecued three with her fire breath. Angel, conserve chakra young one, fighting with such vigor will lead you to tire before the streets are bathed in blood, Habiki admonished even as he darted ahead to slit five Odo shinobi's throats. Angel grunted and kept attacking, mind distracted by thoughts of her human. Naruto. Oh, how she hoped he was okay. She hated that he didn't have her with him, 
she'd tear into anyone who hurt him. But, here she was, stuck killing maggots. Stupid dragon-sama making me not be with Naruto, I'll pee in his shoes for this. She griped and jumped off another rooftop. Fighting mixed with screams and blood were around her, but Angel was distracted. And that's what became her downfall. She missed the shouts at first, so distracted, and took a detour from the shelter's route to end a measly chunin. When she finally made it to the shelter entrance where she would guard for the rest of the invasion, her blood ran cold. Irika Yumino, the rather plain but good academy instructor, the man. Naruto admired greatly and looked up too, was fighting five Sunanin, his students huddled behind him. They were backed against an entrance that had both the under and above ground blown up, blocking them from safety. I won't let you harm my students, they are our future and I will kill you all before you spill even a drop of their blood. Irika yelled bravely. He summoned more kunai, battling all five while dodging jutsu. Angel leaped onto the closest enemy with a yowl of outrage when the bastard attempted to reach Kanoamaru who stood in front of his classmates with a trembling kunai. Clearly, he was being brave, though Angel's protective instincts wished it was a brat she didn't care about being the brave protector. Instead she decapitated her prey and took out another one within ten seconds. The last three launched matching wind attacks on Irika, tearing his back to shreds. Irika sensei all the students screamed. Irika shunshined away to stand back in front of his students, fighting off the lone female, at least it looked female, of the attackers. Angel cursed and jumped on another man's back, severing the spinal cord and shot fire at one of the remaining two. Angel prepared to launch at the final enemy when said enemy used several kawarimi, leaving an active explosive note right in front of the children stuck to the ground, with what Angel recognized as a locked activation making stopping it impossible without sealing ability. The Hell Cat instantly was on top of it, sending a prayer to Naruto and hoped it wasn't strong enough to still kill the children. But instead a bleeding Irika switched with her, then got 500 feet away with the note, deactivating it. The spark stopped, and everyone cheered. Irika looked up, allowing a smile despite his pain. All was well, Angel sighed in relief. Then the tag exploded, sending everyone crashing to the ground. Irika was gone. Back to present. I I took the kids to the next shelter, Habiki helped me after he finished off another squad sent to finish us off. I I am sorry Naruto, I got Irika killed. Angel, despite being feline, burst into tears. Naruto had stopped and stared blankly at the ground for the entire retelling of what Angel viewed as her greatest shame. If only she hadn't been thinking about something other than her job. Naruto plopped down in front of Angel, and took her into a bone-crushing hug. This was not what Angel expected, not after she killed Irika. You are not at fault. The young ANBU agent stated firmly. Angel opened her mouth to protest but was stopped by the icy blue eyes glaring. No. You. Are. Not. To. Blame. You saved Kanoamaru and the academy students, our future. Irika. God, I miss him so much. I didn't even think about him before now, I'm such an ass, aren't I? Naruto's eyes teared up, realizing he barely thought of anyone outside ANBU this whole time. Angel buried her head in his stomach. No. You aren't an ass, and I'm the one who couldn't. Stop the tag, couldn't keep them from hurting him. He was your sensei, your precious person. Yes, he was dot and so are you. I am so grateful you didn't die, Angel. Never doubt that. The tag going off was no one's fault except the Sunanins. He stated firmly. W what? Naruto sighed, and explained how the false deactivation seal, something he just started learning himself, could fool anyone not a sealing specialist, and that Irika being able to deactivate the first level was already amazing and spoke of his dedication to learning as much as possible for his students. 
Irika's death was an accident of war he reminded Angel and himself before noticing it was mid-morning. I think it's time we keep moving, Naruto mused and lifted to cradle the still teary-eyed Angel to his chest. Now, why don't you describe the Suna Chunin who escaped? Angel blinked. Why? Oh, just so that when she shows up one day won a mission or in our possible war with them, I know who to kill very painfully. Hellcat and ANBU agent spent the rest of the trip discussing various ways to kill the one who took out Naruto's first true sensei. The rift that had threatened to blossom at one's reluctance to talk about the invasion mended and drew them closer with each passing torture method discussed. Hey, Shinobi always had dot interesting therapeutic methods. Meanwhile, with Orochimaru. The snake Sanin sat grimacing atop Jirobo's shoulders, stopping himself from killing the fool for almost tripping on a branch. Orochimaru would punish the oaf later, after he found Tsunade and had her heal him. The clumsiness almost made him want to just tree hop himself, only the knowledge that he would need his strength stopped him. He was lucky he had enough chakra to summon a snake to transport them into fire country without alerting the border guards and bringing Kanoha's ire on them. But soon, soon he'd be whole once more. Kimimaro, where is Sonade? He hissed as Kimimaro appeared next to the traveling sound four. Even while hopping the Kagaya bowed, something Orochimaru found pleasing. Orochimaru-sama, I have reason to believe the slug Sanin will stop at Tenzaku quarters for their two-day regional championships in gambling, we should be able to corner her there for you to convince her to aid in your cause. Yes, Orochimaru said after a moment. Excellent work, how long before we Erivis? One day, my lord. Hurry up, and stop bouncing me, Jirobo. He said, smacking the mohawk of the teen. Orochimaru had very little time left, and would not do for a man destined to live forever. Meanwhile, with Yakumo. The Kurama heiress stared at her hands, still shocked at what she did despite the proud pat on the head ferret gave her. She killed, just like Naruto did. She was Dada Shinobi? Or just a killer? Honestly, her emotions were everywhere, leading to the medic shinobis asking her if she needed a sedative. Flashback, Yakumo in the invasion. Yakumo was holed up in one. Of the mountains, hearing the screams and fighting down in the village. She felt so guilty, knowing that she had a personal guard while everyone else had only themselves. Ferret had set her down in the bunker, before going to meet with the Kanoha shinobi assigned to the tunnels for all the shelters. Well, well, Orochimaru-sama will be pleased when we bring you back. A cold voice chuckled. In the doorway, looking smug, was Six Odo Shinobi. Crap, Yakumo's mind supplied. Be a good little girl and we won't hurt you dot much. One of the other five, they all looked the same really, mocked. Yakumo's heart stuttered, and when a kunai grazed her cheek, she let loose. Oh, you want to play eh? A deep voice echoed through the room, emerging from Yakumo. She wasn't sure what was happening that made her suddenly a bystander in her own body, but the smell of urine informed her that the shinobi were not amused. Huh, wonder if Naruto or Kurama ever have their enemies pissing themselves? I'll have to ask over our next ramen date, I mean meal. The heiress wondered, not knowing if she should be afraid of her suddenly demonic voice and demeanor. At least the Kyubi would find it amusing. He'd probably make Naruto tell her another story of him causing mass chaos and destruction. She clearly had odd choices in friends. The enemies at her door had no knowledge of their targets less than sane musings. They were much too busy being terrified out of their wits, one guy going so far as to start some hand seals with the grace of a drunk toddler on caffeine. E-Earth style, he managed before suddenly stopping and plunging a kunai into his own heart. The room shifted for Yakumo, reality becoming a dozen different scenes in quick succession, each darker than the last. A green version of her, a mirror image save for the coloration and face, she did not have a horn or fangs, no matter how epic that would be, thank you very much, stood next to her. Let me take care of, my itty-bitty Yakumo. 
why don't you take a little nap? It said. Suddenly, Yakumo felt heavy, like when the medics drugged her or she ate too much ramen. She felt herself be dragged under, and fighting proved futile. End flashback. Knowing that your Jinjutsu ended up killing five shinobi in two minutes and the last one, their leader, ran away screaming was not as assuring as to Yakumo as everyone thought it should be. Not even she knew what those men saw. Perhaps that was better? She shook her head of depressing thoughts, and went back to writing to Naruto. The idiot hadn't been by to see her lately, and her chest ached whenever she thought about him. The medics assured her nothing was wrong, but Yakumo disagreed. A boy shouldn't make her fever spike or her heart palpitate so hard. She'd have to get a second opinion when the village lockdown was over. Back with Naruto. Tenzaku quarters was magnificent in the midday light, bringing hope to the traveling pair that they just might succeed. Currently the ANBU was crouched in a tree, admiring the wall enclosed town and castle that was over a thousand years old, according to the lore, that is. Tsunade was down there, amongst the hordes of travelers. He had to find her, preferably before the gambling started but first a little recon was in order. Summoning Jutsu Instantly five panthers including Habiki and Akira and Hisoka appeared, rested up and wary. They looked ready for war, as that was what many thought would happen. Naruto, you're dressed dot differently. Habiki mused. The boy just smiled, still not liking not having anything covering his face. Yes, yes, well we're tracking down a Sanmin today and I need your help as Orochimaru is after them too. Recognition dawned in the elder panther's eyes. Ah, yes, the slug still have dot her as a summoner. As the monkeys haven't complained about losing Hiruzen, he's still alive, but knowing the invasion, injured gravely? Yes, and we need her or else. Naruto didn't finish that statement. Anyways, please patrol the forests and town border for signs of Orochimaru or other shinobi, including Tsunade-sama. If you find anything, let me know immediately. All the summons nodded before poofing away. Naruto then sent out numerous clones in various henges before he finally got on the main road with the rest of the travelers. Approaching the gate the young ANBU took a deep breath. Here he would either save his kage and family or doom them to death or retirement. Hey, we got this. Angel whispered. Naruto shushed her. Cats don't normally talk. Well they should, we're better than you smelly humans. Um dot did your cat just talk? A civilian trader looked both disturbed and in awe. Naruto gave a blank stare. I'm sorry, did you say something? He deadpanned, and walked into the city without a second glance. Shursue Uchiha was many things, not that he was bragging. Sexy, badass shinobi? Check. Killer of enemy Jinchuriki and Rouge Root commanders? You got it. ANBU commander who single-handedly brought the corps to new heights? Of course that was him. Overworked Kage? Oh, how he wished it wasn't so. Damn you to the nine pits of hell Hiruzen. When you wake up I'm going to enjoy killing you and it will be legal, as I'll be Hokage. Ha 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 ha, shit, did my paperwork just reproduce? Shursue, still in dragon gear, balked at his growing pile from the invasion. Honestly, how did fifteen shadow clones still not put a dent in the pile? Any more and he'd have to steal from his commander paperwork brigade of clones, which obviously couldn't happen. Why did I ever agree to this job? Not even the promise of torturing the Chunin was worth it. He groaned, scaring the Chunin that came in with more coffee into passing out on the floor. Shursue stared at the young man in distaste. Hawk, take the Chunin away and get me a competent assistant. Sir, Hawk appeared, that was our last one, you've sent four of the last ten to the hospital. Psych ward. And? Your point. I thought shinobi were supposed to be strong-minded, Shursue griped. You uh, yes sir. But the Chunin are dot stressed. Hmm, perhaps you're right. 
Hawk. Why yes sir? Hawk asked, suddenly nervous. You're hired. Hired? As my assistant, of course. Now here's my paperwork, I expect it done after my meeting with the council. And with that, Shursue Uchiha escaped the clutches of evil. He felt no remorse for abandoning his brave man, Hawk, A and Bu were supposed to give up their lives for their Hokage, right? Tenzaku Quarters, Tourist District Naruto smiled despite the mission, enjoying the light-hearted festivities the town provided. He never really enjoyed a festival before, seeing as Kanoha's were tense affairs. The Hokage, and council, would always have something for him to do during festival days, like paying Iruka to hold him over for detention that would turn into take-out ramen and games. Other times the Hokage would send a request for a visit during a cold that always happened on festival days. As he got older, however, the more curious he'd become, but the couple of times he managed to sneak into them he was met with cold eyes hiding fear or curious foreigners that were ushered away by plain-clothed ANBU, not that he knew that at the time. By the time he was ten, Naruto was content to hide out in his apartment when the village lit up, sensing he was unwanted, Tora always dropping by for the day and night to escape her mistress. Then when he became an ANBU, festival days were always during a mission. The spring and summer festivals, midsummer festival, village founding festival, all fell during days Naruto was on an out of village mission. Team Ro had plans to attend the Festival of Heroes, celebrating the end of the various wars and the shinobi who gave their lives up for the village. However, that was months away. So, seeing a festival that was not full of villagers exuding uncomfortable avoidance or overly curious foreigners was a new experience for the temporary brown-haired Anbu, his face betraying his happiness. He wouldn't play any games and had no plans to buy food, but just the atmosphere was enough for him. Oi. Naruto, feed me. Angel Stage whispered, popping her head out of his shirt. She clearly was over the hole, supposed to be a non-talking cat, since the mission was not in a high-stakes area. Or rather it was, but the feline didn't see it that way. Shu, Naruto tried. Nobody paid them any attention but anybody could be observing from the shadows. All the people coupled with Kurama's ongoing nap made telling negative emotions from the cacophony of other emotions impossible, making Naruto even more jittery, though his wonder at the festivities masked it well. To his annoyance, however, Angel just rolled her eyes. Nah. Ru. 2. Feed me. They have sushi rolls. Fried in egg. Stop talking and I will. He said, and Angel's happy nod made the fact he was wasting valuable money and time easier to accept. They had to do reconnaissance after all, right? That's what he told himself as he paid for overpriced sushi encased in egg and vowed to not get distracted again on his lookout for where Tsunade could be staying before the tournament. That is, until he saw it, a game he always wanted to try but never could, ring toss. The game that required aim, which he had in spades, and luck, nobody was luckier than Naruto Uzumaki, a game in which he's wanted to play for years. Nothing was going to stop him. Locking onto his prey, he stalked over to the stand and thrust the needed yen into the shopkeeper's hands, bypassing a couple who had failed five times in row to get a single ring. You uh, sir, you cut in line. Please s stand back and, the shopkeeper was cut off by Naruto glaring like the true ANBU agent he was. Yanking the six rings out of the man's hands, Naruto eyed the bottles calculating. He lined up the first ring, aimed like Tenzo and Hikaru taught him, and launched it. Only to have it bounce off the bottle, mocking him. Growling, the now very embarrassed ANBU turned to the owner. This is rigged. He said. The owner shook his head frantically. Never, my dear sir. I know you, like all my valuable customers, are extremely confident in their skills. This was said with barely held contempt. Clearly the man thought him a commoner by his clothes. However, I assure you that no matter what village you came from, 
no matter what weapon you trained in, will be enough to master this sort of challenge, and I had no need to rig it, as you so claim. Naruto meant to protest, then his well-trained eye caught the gleam holding the bottle up, tightened at an angle that would make every ring bounce off. Well, Naruto just couldn't allow such blatant disregard for sportsmanship, could he? Never mind the fact that he'd do the exact same thing, just so well that he wouldn't get caught. With practiced ease only an ANBU under the unfortunate command of Dragon Sama and Tenzo, Naruto flicked a senbon laced with wind chakra from his wide sleeve. It sang through the air so fast no civilian could ever hope to notice it, slicing the wires that dared make his rings fail. He passed a smirk to the now sweating shopkeeper, before beaming his innocent smile that used to get him out of trouble with Irika. Of course, my apologies. Might I continue this fascinating game? Naruto said diplomatically. The man relaxed minutely and gestured for the undercover shinobi to continue. I'll let you restart, since we're all friends here. Wow, sir. You're really cool. Q internaled groaning at playing naive teenage peasant. Hiding his intentions, Naruto started fumbling, missing his previous grace. Angel peeped out and snickered but was harshly shoved back in at the wide-eyed stare. Determination filled Naruto's being, much like when he was aiming at Jiraiya-sama during spars, nothing would keep him success this time. One ring landed with ferocious. Certainty on the far right ring. Two and three went one after the other on randomized bottles. For flicked out like a viper, almost toppling its bottle over. Five, six, and seven went out as one, ending up on the same bottle without disturbing it. Eight and nine he kept basic, just lazily threw through them with his back turned. Finally, ten. For this one Naruto threw high up into the air. The shopkeeper looked ready to call the game but the ANBU shushed him, and in moments the ring came back and landed comfortably on the far left bottle at the top, worth maximum points. Wow, that was so much fun. Naruto gushed. The man had his jaw hanging as he shakily motioned to the wall of prizes, most of them masks. Naruto looked pensive, before yanking Angel out and plopping her on the counter. How about you pick, girl? Why you? You're letting your cat choose. Naruto tilted his head. Why of course I am. Why wouldn't I? He asked, confusion laced his voice. Man, messing with idiots is fun, maybe I should try doing this in Kanoha? I like the way you think, for once. Kurama's sudden awakening jolted the Jinchuriki, but none noticed it, and when Angel came over with a mask in her jaws, Naruto just laughed as he put it on. Good day to you sir. Oh, and next time you try to rig your game, make it harder to get around. Naruto called over his shoulder, gleefully leaving the shaking crook behind. I must say I approve of your choice, my dear Angel-chan, think that the dragon would let us keep it? Angel purred from her new perch on his head, shaking her head, no. You should just eat this dragon-sama of yours. He puts my container in such a degrading disguise, not one suiting Karama the Great, his fury partner put his two cents in. We don't eat people, it's bad for my digestion. Besides, Dragon Sama is set to become Hokage when we get back, I'm sure the new commander would let us petition for a new mask. Naruto mentally argued. However, a surge of. Was that fear? Well, it pulsed through Karama. I may or may not fear for our, your, village, brat. Naruto rolled his eyes at his friend. For the rest of the day the Jinchuriki filled his biju on what had happened since the impromptu nap, a proud and fearsome fox mask adorned on his face. Tenzaku Quarters, Separate Section Tsunade prided herself on many things yet regretted everything. She was proud of her lineage, being a Senju-Uzumaki mixture. However, her entire family died out to the point her clan would become extinct when she kicked the bucket, leaving only a few branch descendants of such diluted blood they could hardly be called, Senju, anymore. While she never wanted her own children, the thought of such a legendary clan being gone upset her very soul, 
and often her choice of not procreating made shame flush through her system. The Sanlin next prided herself on her medical prowess, prowess that led to nothing in her opinion. What was the point of being a medical genius who invented hundreds of advancements when her abilities failed and not one, but two of her precious people? Nothing. There was no point, not in Sonade's opinion. Her fear of blood was crippling, and often thoughts of her past made her curse her five-year-old self for figuring out how to revive a fish just on a book. Really, if she could, Tsunade would go back to the beginning and not enter the academy. She'd cry to her grandpa who would give in to her whims, as always, and instead she would find something mundane, maybe become a doctor without jutsu. She'd keep Nawaki from the hell of shinobis as well, make him see the beauty of no fighting. Maybe even beat the Hokage dream from his thick skull. Finally, she'd force Dan to retire before that mission, and maybe brainwash him against the Hokage position, the one that took him from her. But most of all, Tsunade regretted leaving. Her pride in her pain made it impossible to come back any time Saratobi Sensei sent out his desperate pleas, and her fear of facing her past kept her moving. But. If only she could just force herself back to her home, sit down with her sensei, maybe things, history, war, death, so much death, would stop choking her to insanity. Oh yes, Tsunade regretted her whole life, regretted that she still felt pride in her accomplishments, regretted that she still saw her country as the best and refused to betray it by traveling to lands they fought against in the three wars. Tsunade-sama? Is, are you okay? Shizun, the only person she never had regrets about gently touched her shoulder. Blinking, Tsunade stared at her winning hand of poker, as the dealer and other patrons gasped at her now monstrous winnings. Huh, it seems she had played multiple hands without realizing it, winning enough to pay off several of her debts. Too bad that whenever she won, darkness followed. Shizun. She barked harshly, hiding her trembling voice. Get the money, we're leaving Tenzaku immediately. W what? We just got here Tsunade-sama. Tsunade-sama? Tsunade-sama? But it was too late, Tsunade had already started towards their hotel, leaving a distraught Shizun and Tantan. The pig had a feeling things would be getting quite interesting as a faint scent of snake whiffed through the air. Gulping, the faithful companion the most difficult master in existence gathered the heavy briefcase and moved to follow her mistress. Dull gray eyes and white hair followed her every movement. Later. Having your old teammate land in a painful crouch before you after almost twenty years apart was not what Tsunade expected to be her darkness from winning. Honestly, must the universe hate her so? She just wanted a short walk by the castle before fleeing her past again, and out popped Kanoha's psycho. Orochimaru. And henchman. She noted dryly. Said henchman looked offended, but the snake Sanin hummed in amusement. Tsunade, you look. Tired. He said with a sick smile. She repressed a shudder. Better than. You, I bet. Orochimaru, Tsunade mocked. I can smell the death on you, your arms are rotting off, immortality not all it's cracked up to be. Orochimaru looked ready to strike but instead chuckled. That's why I'm here, for your expertise. Turning, he motioned to the others with his head. Allow me to introduce you to my elite guards, Jirobo, a beefy teen who looked dumber than a gen and grunted. Next are the twins, Sakan and Yukon, followed by Kadamaru, conjoined twins that mirrored each other stepped forward while a mutated teen with a cocky smirk waved his six arms. A pleasure. She said tightly. It was times like these she regretted not having Shizun on a leash, she had to find her apprentice and get the hell away from her psycho ex-teammate. Yes, well you see, I had a little spat with Saratobi sensei a few days ago, and while I managed to kill the old fool, he left me in need of your assistance. Like hell I'll help you. How dare you, killing sensei. Why, Orochimaru? She punched the ground, making Orochimaru and his guards jump up to rest on part of the castle roof. 
Tears threatened to fall but Tsunade pushed them back. She couldn't believe it, her sensei was. Gone. And the one he prized the most was the one to do it. A part of Tsunade always thought she'd have more time, time to go back home, time to sit down and have tea with the man who was more of a father to her than her biological one. She thought she'd have time to kick him, scream at him, and then apologize, in a roundabout way, and finally feel peace. But her former teammate took that from her. Tsk, Tsk, Tsunade-chan, you're not even listening to what I'm saying, what I could offer you. Instead you are acting like a child. I wouldn't help you, no matter what you offered. Not after what you did to Sarutobi-sensei, she boasted, destroying the ground below her. By now, everyone in town could feel the fight brewing, but neither Sanin cared. Not even if I could bring back your beloved? Give you the chance to have them back, exactly as they left you? Orochimaru countered. Time stopped. Tsunade choked, a chance to get Dan back, the chance to get Nawaki in her arms? Could it really be true? You know, it sounds too good to be true because it is, Tsunade-sama. Jerking at the voice of someone who snuck up on her, something that shouldn't be possible, the slug Sanin turned to see a smiling brunette, hanging upside down. A cat crouched above him, expanding to the size of a panther. A shinobi then. Moments before, with Naruto. He checked every gambling house and hotels, getting more and more frustrated with the lack of results. The only lead was from the main gambling hall, who admitted Tsunade cleaned them out, somehow, before running away like the hounds of hell were on her heels. Thanking the civilians while acting like a lost nephew, Naruto slipped into an alleyway and summoned Akira and Hisoka from their patrol. Naruto, what the hell? We just got a sniff of. The snakes and you pulled us away. The tiny panther ranted from her spot on Hisoka's head. Naruto stiffened. Snake. As in Orochimaru's already here? I've got a bad feeling about this. Kurama remarked. He had been mentioning foul emotions being around the area. Well. Maybe. That or Manda team is here, either way I was going to find out and kick their slimy tails. Akira huffed. Okay, okay. Either way, I need you to help me track down Tsunade-sama, he said and held out the chips she used, having swiped them for scent. His summons glanced at it, took a big whiff, and wrinkled their noses. Yeah, we can find her. Just then a shockwave echoed through Tanzaku quarters, and Naruto looked up dryly at the source, the tourist castle. I believe we have found our elusive medic Nin. Back to the present. Kukukuku, Naruto-kun. I almost didn't recognize you with that impressive shape-shifting, the QB does bless its user with many gifts, though what I'm most interested in is your Uzumaki gifts. Won't you please let me study them? Tsunade's eyes widened at this. Uzumaki, Kyubi Jinchuriki? The only Uzumaki she knew of was Kushina, and she supposedly died almost thirteen years ago. Ma, you got me Oroki Pedo, sorry but Hokage-sama forbids his shinobi from fraternizing with the enemy. The newly named Naruto chirped. His eyes widened, however, and appeared next to Tsunade before she could blink. So fast. Who the hell is this brat? She thought, barely able to track him, before feeling herself be yanked back to the trees. Tsunade could go faster if she really tried, but not by much and the brat looked about twelve. She didn't reach that speed until her late twenties. As soon as they landed, bones lodged themselves where she had been standing. Oh, Kimimaro, you've arrived. And with a package, I see. In Kimimaro's arms laid Shizun, her most precious living person. Blood dripped from the woman's face, slackened in unconsciousness. Taunton was being held by the throat. You. You bastard. I'll kill you, Tsunade rocketed off the branch, destroying the tree, fist cocked. She aimed at Orochimaru's smug smile, only to have the entire group just disappear, a snake taking the hit instead. 
Kukuku, Tsunade. Come to the clearing outside town in two days, alone. Agree to help me and I'll not only give you your brother and lover back, but Shizanchan will remain unharmed. Decide not to, and. Well you know. Oh, and Naruto-kun? I'll see you soon. Orochimaru's voice echoed from everywhere, before it and his presence vanished once more. She lost the last link to the living. She lost Shizun. Well. Perhaps some introductions are in order. The boy from earlier said uncertainly. I'll go first. Naruto Uzumaki at your service. This is Angel, my partner. In place of the brunette was a copy of the last Okage, Minato Namikaze. The fourth sprat. Ha! I lose Shizun and am stuck with the spawn of a Hokage, oh the irony. And Tsunade broke. Crying in the dying light with dust settling around her. I suppose this isn't the best time to mention you've been ordered back immediately to the village, huh? Finally, with Orochimaru. Orochimaru-sama, why didn't we just force the bitch to serve you? We could have taken her, and the Kyubi brat. Kadamaru complained in their hideout. The group had settled in a nearby hideout, Orochimaru stewing. Quiet, you fool. Tsunade is a special specimen, and taking her captive wouldn't have worked. This way she comes to me. I might even get Naruto-kun from this. That brought a manic gleam, the thought of being healed and possessing that Kekiai Genkai. Finished. For now. I'll make time. Night, Kanoha. Ever since the invasion, patrols have been hectic for all levels of shinobi. ANBU would take double or even triple shifts, border guards had to complete the same number of rounds with half their people, and Genin were introduced to the joys of hospital duty. But no other group could hope to hold a candle in most stressful, overworked patrols than the lowly Chunin of Kanoha. Given the most areas, in their opinions, to look over, the least wages, and a freaking monster that hunts them nightly, the Chunin population felt they were the underdogs in their village. Especially after the invasion, where they were asked to volunteer more shifts. Life really wasn't fair if you asked Chunin Patrol Subgroup 4, created to bolster the normal patrols, led by Takisho. This is where we start our tale, of how this group of three men learned the true meaning of fear. Taki, think we can take a break? One Chunin asked their squad leader with a groan. Taki looked up, noticing the one who asked was Shu, his best friend from childhood. Yeah, sure, nothing ever happens on these patrols anyways. The squad leader muttered. The other member of their squad, Mu, shivered as they perched on an alleyway's beam. I'm not so sure about that Taki, the other squads keep talking about a demon that roams around the village, they say it's fifty feet long and has red eyes that would scare the Kyubi. Mu said. Well I heard it's a dragon that the Kyubi birthed to. Sho added. Some even say it's a vengeful spirit from a Chunin guard who died on patrol five years ago. They say if you slack off your toast. Mu covered his eyes at the thought. Taki scoffed. Yeah, yeah, I bet that's utter bull, it's our third village patrol and I haven't seen anything. Just relax, within a month we'll be back to our cushy border patrols with tea, nothing ever happens there. Hey Shu, think your little girlfriend there would make us more of her red bean rice balls? I sure hope so, Shu drooled, wishing he could go back to his lovely local girl with magic cooking. What they didn't know was she was a spy from Kyumo who milked them for information, a spy that wouldn't be alive for very long once their replacements found her, but first our adorable Chunin must be given a fright so large. They decide to never shirk their lowly patrols again. Mist rolled in as Sho finished his fantasies about his girlfriend's cooking. The three gulped, but figured nothing was wrong. This was Kanoha, not a ghost town. Just then, an ominous voice spoke, sending shivers down their spines. One, two, dragons coming for you, eerie chuckling followed, and all three Chunin had their kanai out and ready. Quick, in the guard station. Taki ordered, 
and they darted through the village, mist that somehow turned black followed them. They barely made it, collapsing out of breath against the doorway. Happy they were the only ones in it, Shu, Taki, and Mu believed themselves safe. 3, 4, lock your doors. The voice sang out. Instantly the door just vanished and the mist flooded the station. Ah don't eat us. They screamed. The demonic voice chuckled. 5, 6, better hide and quick. Now the mist became thicker. Quick, the closet. Mu cried and the now openly sobbing trio crammed into a broom closet. 7, 8, you're too late. Tendrils of darkness latched onto the Chunin's ankles and dragged them out. Save us. I don't want to die, I'm too handsome. I'm not, but I sure don't wanna. 9, 10, you'll never sleep again. Cackling filled their minds, and red eyes met theirs. The next morning, when they were found by an annoyed head Chunin, the members of Chunin Squad Subgroup 4 were catatonic and had to be treated at the hospital. They never shirked their patrols again, however. Hokage's Office Shursue sat in his office, fully garbed, and chuckled at his success. It was rather nice to see he still had it, was still able to strike fear into the hearts of Chunin with a basic jutsu and flashing red eyes. He really had to thank Fox for showing him that horror movie, singing demonically really upped his scare factor. Dragon-sama, must you keep scaring the Chunin into Catatonia? That squad's the fifth this month to have to be rehabilitated at my hospital. Show some restraint when punishing them. The current head of the psych ward growled in frustration. Sure, the Chunin never did have the guts to screw up again, but it cost the village a fortune to coax their minds back to a semi-sane place. Well they'll never incur the wrath of the dragon again, will they? You're dismissed. Shursue waved a flippant hand, sending the grumbling medic out. With a happy sigh, Shursue propped his heels on his desk and wondered when Mouse would be back with Tsunade to fix his ANBU, Chunin were too fragile, and his men could endure more of his boredom. Sir, you called for me? A rather jittery Chunin, one who never quite got over their own encounter with him in his early days, peeked in. The mousy-haired man bowed when Shursue just continued staring, still shaking slightly. At least the minion never slacked off, and since the time dragon taught him a lesson, his mission record was spotless and his reports thorough, if a tad. Excessive. Hmm. Go to this outpost near T, find out which local girl has been giving food to our patrol guards. Shursue said nonchalant, pulling out a rather pointy kunai to mess with. The Chunin gulped. I assume I am to ascertain if she is a threat? He asked. A lazy flip of the kunai was his answer. And? And if she is? The usual treatment, take your full squad. A moment of silence passed before a dark aura spiked. Well? Do I have to use you as a training partner for a week to beat some common sense into you? Dismissed. With an eep the poor Chunin was across the village, leaving a cackling ANBU commander and concerned ANBU guards. Not that they would ever say anything, of course. You. You bastard. I'll kill you, Tsunade rocketed off the branch, destroying the tree, fist cocked. She aimed at Orochimaru's smug smile, only to have the entire group just disappear, a snake taking the hit instead. Ku ku ku. Tsunade. Come to the clearing outside town in two days, alone. Agree to help me and I'll not only give you your brother and lover back, but Shizanchan will remain unharmed. Decide not to, and. Well you know. Oh, and Naruto-kun? I'll see you soon. Orochimaru's voice echoed from everywhere, before it and his presence vanished once more. She lost the last link to the living. She lost Shizun. Well. Perhaps some introductions are in order. The boy from earlier said uncertainly. I'll go first. Naruto Uzumaki at your service. This is Angel, my partner. 
In place of the brunette was a copy of the last Okage, Minato Namikaze. The fourth sprat. Ha! I lose Shizun and am stuck with the spawn of a Hokage, oh the irony. And Tsunade broke, crying in the dying light with dust settling around her. I suppose this isn't the best time to mention you've been ordered back immediately to the village, huh? Immediately after, with Naruto. When Tsunade didn't respond, Naruto thought it was safe to continue his orders. Hokage-sama needs your expertise, your village needs your expertise, Tsunade-sama. We have hundreds dead and injured, and many are facing retirement without you. I have orders to bring you back to the village. However, I understand we have, here he was cut off from giving the plan to save Shizun. Tsunade scoffed a bitter laugh. You, a snot-nosed brat, are ordering me back to the village? Don't make me laugh. I've been out of your league since before your parents were tots. Naruto held in what he desperately wanted to say as it would result in his untimely demise. So instead he bit out a polite, it's not me ordering you back, Tsunade-sama. Hokage-sama, well, the acting one while the third is indisposed has issued a recall on your absence. You must return, or Hokage-sama and many others will die. Silence spread between the Sanin and Anbu, dust still setting from Tsunade's attacks. Suddenly Naruto found himself becoming very familiar with the tree trunk. He heard the familiar snap of a broken rib but couldn't bring himself to care once he saw Tsunade's face. It looked as if a demon was staring at him. You! How dare you, Tsunade seethed. She straightened out from the punch she just sent, and dodged Angel's surprise attack from behind, the feline enraged that her partner was attacked without warning. Instead of digging her claws in Tsunade's flesh she was flung harshly into Naruto, shrinking back from her enlarged size. I gave up everything for the village. Everything except Shizun and you expect me to just leave her here and rush off to save an old man already destined to die and some half-cocked shinobi too stupid to stop fighting when they're injured? Naruto felt his anger rise as she continued her rant about the errors of shinobi and how the Hokage was a fool to even try fighting a younger opponent. It began bubbling over, surprisingly mixed with Kurama's own rage. This human is annoying, I vote we kill her and feed her flesh to the crows. Kurama said. His suggestion sounded delightful but they had a mission to complete and Dragon-sama would not be happy if they brought back their only hope dead in a seal. We can't kill her and you know it, Dragon-sama would be disappointed in us. Our perfect mission record would be tarnished. Naruto said mentally. It would be so worth it, Kurama said. The petulance was oozing out of every word. Naruto sent a mental headshake to Kurama and looked at Tsunade's shaking form. Watch what you say about our village, Tsunade-sama. However, I would never want you to leave your apprentice, Shizun, behind. But you have to agree to come back. Like I could even come back, you heard what I'm going to be doing, she said. Naruto looked at the woman who was supposedly his village's only hope in annoyance. Angel actually hissed. He pet his feline companion to settle her. We'll get her back and you will both return, he said. Tsunade scoffed. Right, like your sorry little hide has any chance of surviving those minions, much less their master, Orochimaru. What are you, a genin? Chunin? I'm a fully trained ANBU, you know. Naruto said in protest. He lifted his shirt and showed his tattoo off as proof, knowing that Dragon-sama wouldn't mind if it helped convince her. And I'd rather help you rescue Shizun than report to the village that our other Sanin turned traitor. Tsunade flinched at the biting last word. If there was one thing Naruto hated more than anything, it was traitors. By this point his ribs had fused back together and he was able to stand up. Angel perched on his shoulder. Let us help. Angel said, though she sounded like she'd rather leave Tsunade behind. Only her loyalty to Naruto and Team Ro kept her there. Tsunade let out Sai and finally nodded. I'll heal Sarutobi Sensei and the injured Shinobi, but I'll demand to be allowed to leave afterwards. 
Naruto stayed silent. He had no say if Tsunade would be released from duty once more though he doubted it. The village needed a better medic program, something only a person of Tsunade's caliber could provide. But. That's only if I can get Shizen back otherwise the deal's off. Naruto nodded. That is fair, he said. Of course he didn't say that even if Shizen died in the fight, likely outcome, he would have to bring her back. Some things were better left unsaid. Now we should get out of the spotlight and discuss strategy, Naruto said. Tsunade snorted and led the way. She pushed past the duo, both holding their tongues from retorting. With Tsunade. Tsunade hated the brat in front of her. Or rather, she hated what he represented. A young prodigy, already in ANBU and killing, for the greater good. A boy with Nawaki's face and innocence, though tinged with the toil of being on missions no child should ever be on. Would Nawaki have looked like the ANBU in front of her if he had survived? This boy probably became a shinobi around nine. Based on the QB attack and Minato's death he would be almost thirteen. Barely three years out of the academy and already the Hokage's personal dog. Then again, what could one expect of a Jinchuriki? They were weapons in every village, Kanoha must have decided to use their newest one properly. He probably had a foolish dream to be Hokage with it. Kanoha was her village too, no matter how much she despised the thought of Shinobi. She knew if she survived getting Shizen back she would rush back to Kanoha to save her sensei, her fear of not reconciling ensured that. That is if her crippling fear of blood didn't get in the way. Storming thoughts boomed in Tsunade's mind as she led her temporary leech and his flea bag to her hotel. The owners were shocked but happy to have her back so soon, accepting the request for her same room in stride, though charging more for the festival time slot. So, talk. Tsunade said as they faced each other, sitting on opposite beds. The brat, Naruto she reminded herself, looked at her evenly. His eyes were a cold blue. Angel. Go meet up with Akira and gather information on Orochimaru's movements. Do not get caught or seen, he ordered, still staring at her. The cat huffed and jumped out the window. Once she was gone Naruto flung seal Tsunade hadn't seen since Jiraiya and her fought in the Third War. They were high-level privacy seals. Someone takes after his parents, Tsunade said. What, is Jiraiya already training you to be his next apprentice? Naruto shook his head. Not at all. While Jiraiya-sama teaches me various jutsu and seals, I am not his apprentice as I already have a contract and have a budding career in ANBU as you have seen. No, my path lies elsewhere. You? The fourth spawn doesn't want to be Hokage? Bullshit, she said. So what? You're the granddaughter of our first Hokage and you despise the position. He shot back. Besides this fascination of yours about my future dreams and the Hokage position has no bearings on our current situation. We must plan to get your apprentice back. Dot you're right, Tsunade said. It pained her to say the brat was right, but Shizen came first. I will get Shizen back and you can wait here. She said hoping to rid herself of a kid. Even if said kid was fast as hell and talented in at least seals. We will not be doing that plan since it would be irrational and lead to your death. Stop acting like a hotshot genin and think like an ANBU. An ANBU? Oh, you mean the guys who rush in for suicide hits and act as a graveyard for shinobi? She shot back. Tsunade felt she made a big mistake when the previously blue eyes flashed red. If you had bothered to come back to the village in the last five years you would have learned ANBU has less mortality than any other rank. We fight together in units and play to each member's strengths while negating the weaknesses. For example, you're low on ninjutsu that would help defeat our enemies and have a non-combat oriented summons. However, you're very strong and fast with taijutsu. Meanwhile I am one of the village's top trap makers and my ninjutsu is wide. 
My Kekiai Genkai mixed with my offensive summons will back you up. Wait, Kekiai Genkai? Tsunade asked. She was surprised that he had won, as her grandmother spoke of male Uzumakis, particularly those of mixed blood, having a Kekiai Genkai less often than the female clan members. Chakra chains, he said simply. To demonstrate five chains sprouted from his back, almost glowing. Tsunade's medical mind whirled at the mechanics of the Kekiai Genkai as Kushina had always protected their secrets. She snagged one in her fingers, marveling in their construction. Beautiful, she whispered. And they were. More importantly they were deadly. She had seen Kushina a few times hold off both Jiraiya and the third with them at her peak, able to create barriers with them. Yes, I'm glad I have them. However my weakness is my inexperience, he admitted. Naruto met her gaze, and Tsunade found herself raising an eyebrow. Inexperience? Brat you are in ANBU. You have been a shinobi at least three years at this point. Inexperience my ass. She said. Naruto shook his head. Less than three years. Two and a half. He shook his head again. Lower. Two then. She tried. Try less than a year. I was promoted to ANBU soon after graduation. Certain circumstances demanded I was trained, you know? Tsunade felt her blood chill. A gen in ANBU. Sensei really was insane. And now she had to keep him alive while rescuing her apprentice. Because damn would she be responsible for another child dying, not one that looked so much like her little brother. Back with Naruto. Tsunade's silence was scaring him a bit, Naruto would freely admit. Her staring after he admitted his inexperience was not totally unexpected, but still. Dragon had told him that letting the slug Samni know about his basic past would help in gaining sympathy and build rapport. That rapport could aid in Naruto's mission of getting Tsunade back to the village quietly. Judging by the woman staring at him like he was an infant she saw starving and just had to stop, and help, indicated the story worked. Tsunade-sama, he said. She stared at him still. Snapping his fingers didn't work. After several failed methods he sighed and decided to try a method Dragon-sama swore his lucky kunai by. He chucked a kunai aimed at Tsunade's forehead. Before it connected the kunai was gone and he was held up by the throat. What? The. Hell. She growled. Naruto gulped, perhaps Dragon-sama wasn't always the best role model when dealing with Psycho Kunoichi. I could have told you it would fail, Kurama said. Maybe next time you'll just let me, Kurama the Great, stick some chakra in her. Yes, because poisoning our last hope sounds like a fantastic idea. Shut up, fuzzball. Oi. Fuzzball? I could eat you like a flea, no, a flea would put up more resistance than you. Naruto, don't you dare close the connection. Naruto. Naru, Naruto mentally sagged at the piece as he cut the connection off, and turned back his attention to the Kunoichi who held his life in her hands. You need to get your head on straight, he choked. I an ANBU, so what? It gave me skills we can use to stop Orochimaru. But only if we work together. Tsunade loosened her grip slightly and scoffed. For the last time you're not helping, especially since you shouldn't even be a Chunin yet. We'll have to hide you since my ex-team mate wants you for his sick experiments. God, I'll have to call Jiraiya for this. She ranted. Her words became incomprehensible mutters about Jiraiya's stupidity. Naruto used her distraction and loosened grip to shun Shin to the window. Tsunade looked at him and he gave her his best glare. Jiraiya-sama is on an important mission, as are every able-bodied shinobi since the invasion. We get no backup, and I am more than capable of helping. I can hundreds of clones, fight dirty, hell, I have a contract with someone specializing in assassination. He was getting fired up as he said this. While he did not believe they could save Shizun, he had to try. 
if only to prove to yet another person who thought him worthless before knowing him. You think you can actually do something? She said. Naruto nodded. Absolutely. Fine then, I'll let you help. She gave a smirk as Naruto started nodding relief. If you can last five minutes against me. Naruto felt all color drain from his face and Kurama shivered as the connection opened back up. They were dead. So, so dead. Later, secluded field. Naruto stood across from Tsunade as the moon rose into the festival-lit sky. His clones had set up chakra blocking and barrier seals, hopefully preventing anyone from sensing his demise. Tsunade looked very confident as the wind blew her hair around, smirk set firmly on her face. You want to fight? Well fine then. Last five minutes against me before I knock you out and I will let you help. When I beat you. However, you will stay out of my way or I will drug you and stash you in a cellar. Are we in agreement? Yes. I look forward to aiding in Shizen's rescue, Naruto said. The confidence in his voice was undermined by his gulping. If only he could have had Hikaru or better yet, Tenzo, here to help him. You wish. Anything goes. One, they said in unison. Naruto crouched, Tsunade mirroring him. Two, both combatants began molding their chakra. Three. Twin flares of chakra had Tsunade's fist landing where Naruto was less than a second before. His training had him on the other side of the clearing, however, running through hand signs. Wind style, air bullets, he released, lungs belting out chakra infused bullets of air. They cut through the clearing, chopping down grass and trees, but Tsunade flung a chunk of earth in the bullet's path, protecting herself. The chunk landed dangerously close, too close for comfort and Naruto leapt away. He landed in a skid, only to have Tsunade in his guard. The pair danced, a frenzied ballet of sweat and anger. Tsunade would jab towards his throat and Naruto would dodge and use his palm to redirect her fists. Tenzo's and Hikaru's influence shined through, keeping his movements hard to follow. Tsunade quickly decided adding in feet and random chunks of the once lush clearing was the way to defeat him. His taijutsu was not enough, forcing him to shunshin multiple times. Tsunade was able to track him this time, however. Naruto felt a knee to his stomach, blood forcing its way out of his mouth as he flew into a tree. Vaguely he noted this was becoming an unpleasant common occurrence with the slug San Nin. Tsunade shuddered at the blood almost touching her, and Naruto's eyes widened, remembering her fear of blood. He could use it, but it had to be planned right. Give up? Tsunade taunted after she recovered. She leaped and came crashing towards him. Naruto bit out the pain and bounded away with back flips. Midair he unsealed a water scroll. Water style, hidden mist jutsu echoed as the entire field became a thick fog. He landed silently despite a wince and summoned a hundred clones. Some concealed him, while others became rocks and kunai around the field. You think this will stop me, brat? I'm more than capable of getting around in this fog, Tsunade said from wherever she was. Naruto couldn't care at the moment, feeling his torso flare in protest. Shit. If I wasn't an Uzumaki or Jinchuriki she would have landed me in the hospital. He thought. Kurama sent chakra to him, its healing powers taking effect. That was the point. She wants us out of her way. Kurama pointed out. Naruto nodded. Well too bad, we cannot let that happen. We just have to last three more minutes. Kurama, let's go wild. Naruto could feel his biju's glee at the prospect and felt three tails burst forthright as Tsunade appeared from the mist, taking fifty clones who jumped at her out. Naruto met her fist with his Kurama. Chakra infused chains, watching her wince as the vile chakra attempted to corrode her. He wrapped them around her wrists, hoping to bind her. Tsunade pulled Naruto close by one of his chains and smacked him back several meters. 
Don't use chains on Tsunade, he noted. Tucking them back in, Naruto held both hands behind his back. Twin swirls of purple raisingan, one for each hand, formed. Tsunade was in his guard again, and Naruto ducked below what was supposed to be a grappling throw. Try this on for size. He called out and took both Rasengan out. Looking up from his lowered position he watched Tsunade's eyes widening. He let a feral-looking smirk form as he shoved both balls of chakra into her torso. He felt slightly vindicated for earlier as her torso became a mess of chakra burns and she was shot back several meters. The spiral on her stomach instantly started healing. Tsunade had grazed both hands, however, and made them useless with her medical chakra. She struggled to stand, breathing heavy. Naruto heaved also as the bursts of fighting were intense. I will admit you impressed me even if I've slacked off for a decade. But your hands have been rendered useless for at least five minutes, even with your demon. Give up before I hurt you. Naruto snarled at the accusation that he would give up on such an important fight. Besides, he didn't really have to keep fighting. Never. Catch me if you can, he said. With that, Naruto used a kawarimi with a clone and thus began a game of cat and mouse. As he dodged various rocks, punches, and trees, Naruto couldn't help but send a prayer of thanks to his dragon-sama. Without the hellish training he would be dead. It really showed how much his commander cared. Even if the mad cackling made it feel like Naruto was just there for entertainment at times. Clones started taking hits left and right, all on close calls with Tsunade's deadly fists. Each time one popped Naruto felt his anxiety grow. Nevertheless he kept dodging. More time passed, and his hands still hung limp. Naruto saw a stray kunai in a branch, and knowing he needed something, grabbed it with his teeth. There had to be barely any time left, but Tsunade had cornered him to a crater, his chakra beginning to wane with Kurama working on his hands. The ragged knife was clutched in his teeth. Really, a kunai? What the hell will that do? It's time for you to go to sleep for a couple of days. Naruto met her dead in the eyes before stabbing his left shoulder deeply. Blood sprayed out, covering Tsunade who had come close. She dropped to the ground and started shaking. An alarm clock rang out faintly from a clock, signaling he had done it, he stayed in the fight against Asan Nin. Tsunade kept shivering but Naruto kept his expression blank. You said I wouldn't be useful, yet I'm still able to fight while you're a mess on the ground. Grow up, Tsunade-sama, I may be young but I won our bet. I'm going back to the hotel to rest. Tomorrow we'll plan what to do. With that, Naruto walked away, letting his chakra recede and weariness set in. He let a limp set in and made his way to their room, Kurama's smug cheers his only companion. With Tsunade. Tsunade watched the boy who outsmarted her limp away, her hands shaking. She couldn't believe it, her weakness turned against her. Well that was his point, she thought ruefully. He did it so she would have to accept his help, now that he knew her weakness. Damn you Naruto Uzumaki. She said with no malice. The moon was high in the sky before she managed to stand up and walk back to the brat. She never noticed the henged clones of Naruto following her to ensure a safe return. With Naruto and Tsunade, day of the rescue operation. This won't work, Naruto grumbled as he was carried without ceremony towards the meeting spot with Orochimaru and henchmen. Tsunade huffed. Quiet, it's supposed to buy us time, you have your clones ready? Naruto sighed. Yes. Though why we couldn't have used a clone for this is beyond me. Orochimaru would sense that. Now, quiet, we're getting close. He sighed and hung limp tied up. Tsunade reached back and slapped a gag in his mouth, for good measure. This whole plan made him seriously doubt he would be making it home alive. Him, captured and being traded by Tsunade for assurance and her dead loved ones? Yeah, right. 
Over the last two days Naruto had learned two things about Tsunade. First was that Tsunade was vicious when angry, and wasn't opposed to flicking you into the street if you annoyed her. The second was that she loved Konoha and everyone in it. Despite her mean exterior and biting tongue, she loved the village. Even if she didn't seem to know it. Naruto could tell it in every story she used to describe why she would never stay in the village again after doing her job and in every scoff that the village would love her to be back. They reached the meeting point, Orochimaru already there with his elite guard. His smug smile at seeing Naruto tied up and bruised sent chills down the Jinchuriki's spine. Shizun was tied up and standing with the Kagaya, her face set in a brave frown. Ku Ku Ku, Tsunadeheim. You brought me more than I bargained for. Orochimaru said. He licked his lips, eyes cold like the snakes they were based on. Tsunade snorted. Whatever, Orochimaru, give me my apprentice and I'll heal you. This brat, here Tsunade dropped Naruto harsher than needed, in his opinion, is so you still give me Dan and Nawaki back. I demand them back. Of course, of course. I must say I'm impressed you subdued an Uzumaki, I can't even feel his chakra you have it sealed so well. I would be most delighted to give you your lover and little brother back. First, though, heal my body. Jirobo, Orochimaru said. Jirobo, the giant of the group, stepped forward and grabbed Naruto. Naruto had to keep himself from impaling the enemy giant with his chains. This whole plan depended on a surprise. Attack and them believing Naruto was helpless. He watched through lidded eyes that made them think he was drugged as Tsunade walked over to Orochimaru. She kept a straight face, even as Orochimaru started speaking again. I do find it delicious how quickly you turned on our former home, Tsunade, weren't you always on Sensei's side? Oh how the mighty have fallen! He said, half taunting. Tsunade tensed but kept moving her hands towards Orochimaru's limp ones. This was the moment, when Tsunade would take him out of the game for good and Naruto would attack the others. It had to be timed perfectly. Of all things, however, they didn't count on Orochimaru leaping back. His elite guard followed, Naruto getting yanked along. You dare betray me! Orochimaru screamed. Naruto took that as a cue he had to get out of there. With a surge of chakra that overrode the drug Tsunade had given him to hide his chakra like it was being bound, chains ripped through Jirobo's entire form, one of them decapitating him. The first of their six enemies fell lifeless to the ground. Naruto dodged the four shinobi that verged on him, shunshining to Tsunade's side as she jumped further away from their enemies. Kimimaro still held Shizun, though looked conflicted in if he should move to protect his master. Glad you got out, Tsunade told Naruto. She pointedly didn't look his way to avoid the sight of blood. Thanks, he said dryly. Told you the plan wouldn't work. Shut up. We killed one. Only five more to go. And those five are all a rank or above. This will end so well. He replied. He quickly summoned his chosen fighters and angel from the spot they were waiting with a sign. They appeared battle-ready, a mix of panthers and tigers being backed by an enraged hellcat. Hisoka, Akira, you and Half-Clan take out those twins. Naruto ordered as said twins came in for an attack. They diverted the pair with quick parries and claws laced in stinging poison. Habiki, take the elites to hold off the spider guy. Angel, think you can handle the girl? Of course. Angel said and tackled the girl to the ground as proof. It was going to be a fight the cat would remember, Naruto mused. Can you take on a Kagaya? They're no joke, Naruto, Tsunade questioned as she punched earth up to stop a torrent of bones. Shizun was sometime tossed to the twins by Kimimaro, who got ready for another attack. Yes. Naruto said finally. He knew it would have ended with him fighting the Kagaya, even if their first plan worked. The Kagaya was too powerful for him if one compared their strengths in a fair fight. 
Good thing he was an ANBU who was trained to never fight fair against allies, much less enemies. You should surrender. Kimimaro said tonelessly after Naruto led him away from the two San Nin, both who summoned their bosses at the same time. Naruto was so glad he didn't have to face that psycho. Yeah, and you should get some sun, we don't always get what we want. Wordlessly he summoned clones, his other ones arriving with traps and their jobs ready. Three tails burst out one after the other while Kimimaro dispelled the clones effortlessly. The Kagaya aimed bone missile after bone missile at Naruto, who used both clones and chains to block. Okay, how do I defeat this guy? Naruto thought for the thousandth time since he came across Tsunade. Kurama growled too as they were forced on the offensive. I cannot kill you as Orochimaru-sama needs your body, but I will not hesitate to cripple you. Kimimaro informed him while slicing his arm guard off. Blood oozed from the wound but Kurama's chakra forced it closed instantly. That's if you get the chance, Naruto countered. He formed a Rasengan and used it to splinter a bone sword aimed at his torso. They jumped back from each other and flung weapons at the other. Naruto's wind chakra infused Kanai met Kimimaro's bone sword, the latter tearing the other apart. They launched into another dance, Kimimaro effortlessly tracking and blocking him. Naruto would fling him with a tail or chain and Kimimaro would use it to his advantage. Wind style, great breakthrough jutsu. Was released, its powerful gusts pushing Kimimaro away enough for Naruto escape the close combat mess. He noticed Kimimaro coughing up blood and tucked the information away for later. Naruto knew he had no chance if Kimimaro could see him. So, he once again pulled out his water scroll, his last one after the mess that was the invasion. Water style, hidden mist jutsu. The area around Naruto and Kimimaro became the familiar murky atmosphere. Taking advantage of the cover Naruto let Kurama's negative emotion sensing guide him to the still calm Kimimaro. Quietly Naruto summoned more clones who engaged in melee combat, breaking the Kagaya's guard before being dispelled. He took advantage of their distraction and used his headhunter jutsu to dive under the earth. With stealth and luck Naruto managed to grab onto the Kagaya's ankles and drag him under. Leg bones grazed Naruto's palms but he kept going, appearing on the ground while Kimimaro was in the ground looking for murder despite still having a blank face. Kimimaro sighed. Very well then. His face became a sea of black and red, then turning a dark color. He erupted out of the earth, thick bones protruding out of his hand and back. Shit. Naruto gulped, leaping back into the fog to get away from the now monstrous-looking Kagaya. Naruto, smell the blood and death on him. Kurama said. Naruto, with his enhanced senses, took a sniff. Despite the fog blurring everything, Kimimaro was reeking of death now that he noticed. Yeah I noticed. You think we can take him out using this? Naruto asked. Kurama seemed to think he was an idiot. No you dingbat. We simply have to have him use all his chakra. He's on death's door, probably chakra poisoning from inbreeding, the Kagaya never could get outsiders to sleep with them. Make him expend the chakra he has. And the curse seal will do the rest. Naruto mentally nodded. Expend the chakra. He could do that. Summoning more clones Naruto sent them Kimimaro's way while he prepared his favorite branch of fighting, seal traps. With Tsunade. When Naruto had sent his summons off to fight without his input, Tsunade was both shocked and worried, rarely did shinobi trust their summons were powerful enough to take on fully trained shinobi unless it was through combo attacks with their summoners or at least fighting side by side. Especially with smaller summons like the ANBU agent. Worse was Naruto going after the Kagaya, despite that being the plan. Tsunade knew how deadly the Kagaya Kekiai Genkai was, and one strong enough to be on Orochimaru's elite squad was terrifying. Hopefully Shizun could free herself with the help of those summons or Tsunade could finish off her ex-teammate. Ku ku ku, distracted, are we? 
Orochimaru laughed from atop Manda. The bastard had promised the snake three hundred sacrifices after it helped Orochimaru win. The snake was more than happy to comply, thus leading to Katsuya being overwhelmed by the snake. Katsuya split. Go to Shizun, she ordered after the boss slug was wrapped around her middle, Manda hissing. Katsuya complied, shooting acid at Manda's underbelly while she did it. The snake screeched and reeled back. Only because you're not worth my time, Orochimaru. Tsunade said and jumped into his guard. Orochimaru elongated his neck, going for a bite, but Tsunade squeezed his neck and catapulted him off Manda's head. Tsunade took the chance and grabbed the snake by the tail, flinging it into the sky. Hopefully when it crashed it would dispel. She had more important things to worry about, however. Orochimaru landed in a crouch and vaulted forward. He opened his jaw and his infamous sword came out. Tsunade did a cross block, long gashes on her arms appearing. She did an uppercut, ignoring the blood in the heat of the moment. They kept dodging each other after that. Tsunade grabbed the sword at one point and pulled Orochimaru to her. Taking one of his useless arms in her hand she crushed the bones beyond repair, relishing in the anguished screams that followed. Dark chakra, darker than the Kyubi chakra she felt from Naruto hit her from the directions of the various fights. The strongest was in Naruto's misty area, however, and Tsunade made a decision. Katsuya. She called for one of the few slugs that had remained. Go help Naruto. It wouldn't be enough. She had to finish this quickly. Thus, she fired up her medical chakra, intending to slice Orochimaru to ribbons from the inside out. That won't work, Tsunade, Kimimaro probably has him fighting on his last legs by now. Help me and I'll let him live. Orochimaru said. His breath was labored and pained. Never. She spat. Orochimaru used a shunshin into her space and released snakes from his tunic, a testament to his skill that he did not use hand seals. Tsunade ignored the stings of snake bites and activated her seal, feeling it spread across her body. Injuries healed instantly, and Tsunade struck her jutsu at Orochimaru. Various points across his body were struck tearing a muscle here, breaking a tendon there. Several seconds later and Orochimaru was starting to feel the effects of his system being torn apart while already weak. He launched his sword, and this time it hit. Tsunade gasped as her whole body became flames. Being impaled was never fun, especially with poison swords. This is the same poison that killed Sensei, Orochimaru hissed. Tsunade slid it out with her hand, careful not to rip her spin in half. Her ex-teammate didn't give her any more time and they were back at it. She healed herself carefully while dodging fangs and kicks. Her ragged breath matched Orochimaru's, they were both too old for this. Give it up, I'm able to heal myself. You, on the other hand, are a walking corpse. I can see the rot on your body, Tsunade said as she kicked him in the side while cutting the tendon in his heel. Orochimaru ignored it and sliced her side once more. Not until you heal me, Tsunade, I refuse to die. He hissed. Tsunade rolled her eyes as she healed herself again. By this point wrinkles were showing and growing. You can't use ninjutsu and you turned your body into an experiment, go, die in peace. For once in your life admit you lost. Minutes of combat pass and Tsunade was becoming convinced they would both collapse dead over each other. A sea of bones impaling her shoulder and Orochimaru's head was not how she expected the battle to end, however. Several bones were three or four times the size of any human bone, including the one that destroyed Orochimaru's brain. Blood was everywhere. Tsunade finally broke. Her teammate was gone, and they were both covered in blood. She slowly pulled her shoulder off of the long bone, was it a spine? Hyperventilating, Tsunade justified her cowardice in that she took out the village's worst missing nin. She could sit here and cry, right? A burst of Kyubi chakra jolted her out of her stupor. 
Naruto. When she turned her head, images of Nawaki's corpse flashed through her head, Naruto couldn't become Nawaki. Back with Naruto moments before. When ANBU were against the odds, they became their most dangerous. That's what Dragon would tell the Corps during Inter's quad trainings and in his experience that was true. Naruto was hoping it would prove true once more, as Kimimaro had become easily S-class with the seal on his neck activating. No matter where Naruto ran in the mist, the now crazy Kimimaro was able to track him. Several times only clones saved him and Naruto's clothes were resembling Swiss cheese. After the third time of narrowly escaping bone pulses, he released a great breakthrough in several air bullets, damaging Kimimaro and pushing the basically useless mist away. Hey, at least it helped him tire the bastard out. Naruto's Chains and tails were working overtime once more, this time fighting against a tail too, Kimimaro somehow grew a physical tail and it was freaking the ANBU out. I will overcome you, Orochimaru-sama must have you. Kimimaro said. Naruto got behind him with a shunshin and kicked hard. Kimimaro was barely phased but coughed up more blood. Sounds like you won't overcome anyone, you're dying, aren't you? He taunted. Naruto jumped over bone spikes that launched at him in retaliation and spun in the air to avoid the finger bullets once more. As long as I am serving Orochimaru-sama I will live on. Even in death I will serve him. Kimimaro's eyes had become zealous, and Naruto knew he was almost at a point he could push Kimimaro over the edge. Doubt it. Naruto said. He released another great breakthrough to shield him from the bones, blowing the rest of the now fragmented mist away. Kimimaro was sagging, and it looked like he was ready to fall over. Orochimaru-sama is my everything. Kimimaro insisted. Willow dance. He said and longer spikes than ever grew, as Kimimaro attacked Naruto. Another moment of ruthless fighting happens before an idea struck when he saw Tsunade running Orochimaru into the ground. Well then why aren't you helping him? Naruto asked. He looks pretty bad over there. If my Hokage was in danger I'd protect him rather than go after an enemy, guess that's the difference between us, huh? I have true loyalty while you're just a rabid dog. Be ready, Naruto. Kurama warned. Naruto nodded and prepared a shunshin and clones, his chains going out in front. How? Kimimaro's chakra spiked. How dare you? He bellowed. If possible, his skin grew darker. A 360-degree sphere of bones launched out, and Naruto prayed his preparations would be enough. I'll kill you imbecile. Naruto used dozens of shunshins to escape the bones and had chains going wild with tails, but he still got torn to ribbons. Eventually the torrent stopped, and Naruto was so adrenaline high he didn't feel any pain. His kyubi chakra pulsed before receding, his max long spent. Naruto, Kurama said. Naruto could barely hear him. Instead he focused on the collapsed form of Kimimaro Kagaya. Gray eyes met red ones and the two opponents knew the end had passed. I I will not. Kimimaro tried. Blood poured from multiple places, both from himself and Naruto's chains throughout the fight. With a final shaky breath Kimimaro died. Naruto let out a sigh of relief and collapsed on his bottom, intent on getting up to help Tsunade or the other fights. But he couldn't move. And he couldn't breathe, every intake feeling blood filling his lungs. His now cloudy eyes drifted down to his lungs, where right below his heart a thin spinal column went through to the other side. It missed his heart, the only reason he was still living, but when Naruto tried to raise his arm to grab it he couldn't. It was like all his strength was sapped out, and his life was. Fading. Kekarama, he choked. Naruto. Naruto, hold on. You have to pull it out, now. Naruto. Don't you dare pass out. Naruto. But Naruto was already falling to the side. His last conscious thought was that Dragon-sama would kill him for dying. 
Naruto, he heard. But he had no clue what that word meant. With Tsunade. When Tsunade reached the boy, who reminded her of Nawaki, she felt her insides turning to slush. All she wanted to do was throw up and forget about the growing puddle of blood and bone protruding out of his lung. Naruto had been impaled. If he was anyone else, she would be staring at a corpse. If he was anyone else, Tsunade would feel justified in running off to save Shizun. But Naruto was not anyone else, he was a Jinchuriki. Already she could see the Kyubi chakra attempting to close the hole and corrode the Kagaya's Kekiai Genkai away, though it was futile. Blood. Just like Nawaki. Just like Dan, like the war, the hospital. Blood, blood, blood. Oh God, all this blood. Can't do it. Blood. Blood. Blood blood blood, okay, Tsunade, you can do this, she muttered, like a mantra. Steadying her hands, she gripped the bone and pulled, slowly. Normally it would take forever, requiring her to saw the impaling object down and take out as another medic, Shizun, healed the damage left behind. However, she didn't have that kind of time and Shizun was who knows where. Thus, Tsunade yanked it out with little regard for protocol. Considering her patient did not flatline she took it as a minor victory. Arg Naruto moaned, still unconscious. Tsunade instantly had both hands on his chest, using chakra to simultaneously siphon the blood out and mend the hole. She pointedly refused to dwell on the fact she was kneeling in blood, breathing in blood, covered in blood. 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 Blood everywhere. Oh God, what was she thinking? She can't do this. Blood. Blood. Shut up. If anyone heard Tsunade scream at her own subconscious she would kill them later. For now, screaming calmed her down and allowed her to continue her work. Minutes felt like hours. She connected blood vessels and inflated a lung trying to collapse. Tendons that were shredded in the chest got reattached. Suddenly there was Kyubi chakra erupting from the wound once more, closing it up faster than should be humanly possible. Not even Kushina had healed this quickly, and her healing factor had been studied extensively. Tsunade mused it had to be from how well Naruto wielded the beast and moved on to other injuries. She would let the demon finish up the lung. Broken bones. A concussion. A torn ACL and the muscle surrounding his stomach shredded. Another bone shard narrowly missed the spine and had to be brought out. Tsunade healed them all to acceptable levels, praying he survived the shock and blood loss. She had force-fed him three blood-replenishing pills, but Jinchurikis could be tricky in what their bodies accepted as blood. Finally feeling satisfied when Naruto looked like he would be healed within a couple of days, she stopped the chakra flow. Any more forced healing could be counterproductive in the long run, the body not understanding that it was already healed and didn't need to do anything. Tsunade took a deep breath, refusing to let the sticky blood covering her lead to a breakdown. Shizun still needed her, and Orochimaru was gone, at least she hoped so, so Naruto could lay here without being attacked. Tsunade-sama Shizun's voice rang out across the clearing, and never had a voice sounded so much like heaven. Tsunade whipped her head around, eyes already assessing her apprentice. The girl Tsunade raised was covered in grime and blood, carrying Naruto's useless cat, but she was alive. There did not appear to be any lasting damage. Sure, Shizun, Tsunade choked out. Her tears began flowing as her apprentice reached her and dropped down in a crouch as the cat curled up with Naruto. Already Shizun's hands were glowing green, analyzing her for injuries. Where? What happened to Orochimaru's lackeys? That was the big question, one that would decide if they could go back to town or if Tsunade carried Naruto as they ran to the village, who knew if Orochimaru had more people waiting for the others to return and report? We killed them, well, all but Tayuya. Shizun said. Tsunade's brow furrowed. Tayuya? Tsunade was bad at names, 
but it sounded like the female Otonin. Er, sorry Sunade sama, I meant the female. Angel Chan here tore into her, however, and I don't believe she will last long. She's probably already dead. The others. Well, those summons are fierce. Tsunade sighed in relief. Good. Just to be sure, we'll leave for Kanoha as soon as the brat wakes up. You? The village? Shizun looked so confused. Tsunade smiled and scoffed. Of course, we have to go back to the village, they can't even survive a pesky invasion without me. Why, back when I was a genin, invasions happened monthly. Perhaps things would be okay. Hey! Angel yelled suddenly, as if realizing something. Naruto isn't a brat, he's the only reason you won, I bet. Her smug look when Tsunade didn't outright deny it only added fuel to the fire. Perhaps they wouldn't be until Tsunade accidentally made the feline mute. Naruto wouldn't even have to know, right? In Kanoha, with Dragon slash Shursue. Shursue overlooked the various progress reports that were pooling into his office hourly. Honestly, if he wasn't already on the path to blindness, thank you, Mangekyo Sharingan, the Hokage position would make him need reading glasses within the year. Why couldn't his shinobi learn to write legibly? His ANBU could, though Shursue supposed it was due to the handwriting practice he enforced on all recruits, having sloppy-looking penmanship was such a chunin thing to do. So far, the village was faring well, all things considered. The academy was being used as a station for the students and injured genin to get. Assignments that assisted in rebuilding the village. Yakumo Kurama was set to undergo the unsealing within a month, allowing them to train another genjutsu specialist, something they desperately needed. His shinobi were taking double or triple missions, one right after the other, and even the genin were pulling their weight with extra D and C ranked missions in addition to reconstruction projects. By the end of the week they could hold their village-wide memorial, letting everyone move on with their grief. If only Mouse would return with Tsunade, they could get everyone, including the third, back to fighting condition, only then could Shursue feel slightly relaxed. Kanoha was headed to war, and they needed every able body they could spare. Dragon-sama, the head ANBU medic, dear, said as he dropped down in a crouch. Shursue nodded for the man to speak, knowing he was coming from their guest. What is it? Dragon-sama, the Suna Jinchuriki had to be suppressed by Tiger again. The strain the five-point seal put on the already faulty containment seal is tearing away at the Jinchuriki's mind. Deer said in a monotone voice, though Shursue could hear the concern, Jiraiya was out for another week at least, and even Naruto was unavailable due to his mission. If the seal holding back Shikaku collapsed before they returned and could either put a better seal on for Gara or extracted the demon to go into a Kanoha shinobi, they would be in trouble. Shursue could stop a rampaging demon, but he honestly didn't want to. Killing such a pitiful prisoner as Gara, one that had the potential to be a much needed ally, also didn't sit well with him. If only they could get Gara to do his damn job and suppress the tailed beast within. While a seal is necessary to contain the beast completely, Gara actively wishing for the seal to break and kill himself was not helping matters. This childish behavior had gone on long enough, and Tenzo could not keep doing this. I will handle this. Shursue stated, standing up. Before his ANBU guards could follow he did a series of shunshins until he was outside the secure building that held Gara. It had been around since Mito Uzumaki and was built by her specifically to hold Jinchuriki in the case of them losing control or needing to reseal their demons. Walking down the hallways that oozed suppression seals, Shursue stopped outside the door that housed what could either be a magnificent ally or temporary vessel until they transferred the demon. Dragon-sama, the three ANBU guards saluted. Captain Tiger is with the Jinchuriki now, sir. Shursue suppressed a smirk at his ANBU, wishing he had the time and energy to mess with them. However, he was on a schedule and the elder meeting in an hour was not one he could miss. Stand down. He ordered. 
Without another word, Shursui slipped into the dark room. Tenzo didn't need him to speak, leaving with a nod of his head. If only all his shinobi could read his mind like that. In the middle of the room, cell, really, sat Gara, encased in wooden cuffs. Sand was in heaps around him, and his dark eye bags were somehow even worse. A foul stench hung in the air, mixed with hints of chakra. In other words, Gara looked like death. You are causing problems for my ANBU. There, blunt and to the point. Shursui preferred to settle this matter quickly. That is their problem, Gara replied, monotone. They should let me die I am worthless. Well, damn. Shursui had not been expecting such honesty. If you behave, we can remove the five-element seal, and begin negotiating. Shursui acts as if Gara's admittance of suicidal thoughts did not happen. However, that cannot happen if you have no will to live. I do not. Gara looked content to die, but Shursui really didn't want to have to create another Jinchuriki for his village, to have to wait for a child to grow up and master the demon. It would be much easier if the boy would work for Kanoha. Sure, Shursui was planning on resealing the beast that died with Han when it resurfaced, but the task of protecting a child Jinchuriki was massive. Kanoha simply did not have the manpower to spare for such an endeavor, not when war was on the horizon. Kanoha is better than Suna, you know this. We have no doubt fed you better, no one has hurt you beyond necessary, and my ANBU have not scorned you for what is inside. You would be allowed a shower if you agreed to our terms. Shursui tried again. Bringing in Ibiki would have defeated the purpose of recruiting Gara, so they had hoped this isolation would have worked, it didn't. Holding in a sigh, Shursui prepared to leave after giving one last warning about trying to let Shikaku free. Already he was thinking of using the Sharingan on the boy to keep him docile, though it would require him being there to monitor. Changing his thoughts with Koto Amatsukami could work, but Shikaku could just mess it up by speaking to Gara inside his mind again. Why did Naruto Uzumaki defeat me? It was a question said as a statement, and it stopped Shursui in his departure. Because he had people to fight for, Shursui finally said, choosing his words carefully. This could be a turning point for Gara. People to fight for? Gara asked. The concept seemed foreign. His village, comrades, and friends. I can only fight for myself, there is no one else to fight for. Well then, perhaps it is time you changed that, Shursui remarked, leaving with a smirk. Perhaps the boy wasn't a helpless case after all. Gara sat in his cell, unmoving, for hours, ignoring the ANBU guards that spoke to him and not caring for the food. Naruto had his people, where were Gara's? With Naruto. Waking up was not what Naruto thought would happen when he passed out. Nor did he think he would wake up in a comfy bed, the hotel walls staring back at him. He tried to be alert, to assess the situation in case he was somehow captured, but that took too much effort. Erg, he groaned in an unintelligible garble. Gasps from what he assumed was across the room made him turn his neck. He winced even as his eyes took in the blurry form of Tsunade and Shizun, with that pig and angel riding on her shoulders. Brat. Tsunade said, even as her hands turned green. Naruto shivered as the medical chakra flowed over him. You almost died, still might, if you didn't have me and that furball in your gut. Tsunade-sama. Shizun said. She sounded exasperated but fond. Naruto processed that they must have all survived, they were in their hotel room, he knew Kimimaro was dead, and Orochimaru was also dead. Wait. Oro.maru, gay? He asked, his dry throat making talking more difficult than ANBU trivia night. Tsunade huffed a laugh. Yeah, he's dead. Uzumakis, of course your first thought is about that psycho. Gu Naruto muttered. He decided to try and sit up. The pain shooting up through his lungs and stomach almost made him give up. Almost. He wasn't an ANBU agent for nothing. 
the bone. God, that phantom pain made him shudder, and the complete fight came rushing back with the viciousness of an avalanche. He really was lucky for Karama. Speaking of which. Karama. You there? Naruto thought loudly, hoping his partner was awake. Barely, you flea-bitten meat bag. Karama snapped. Oh boy, he was mad, Naruto realized. Yeah. It's. Not my fault. And thank you. Humph. You're lucky I, Karama the Great did not wish to have to reform, or else I would have let you die. Honestly, death by impalement? How insignificant. Naruto smiled at his friend's way of showing his worry. It was a close call, one Naruto hoped he never had to go through again but was not foolish enough to bet on. He was a shinobi, and almost dying was part of their career. Brat. Brat. Tsunade's holler and smack on the back of his head that sent stars to his vision got Naruto's attention. You ouch. What was that for? I swear, Tsunade-sama, you're like an old hag sometimes. Silence rang in the hotel room, save for Angel's snickering. He could faintly hear Karama pray for a peaceful death. Tsunade's eye twitched, and her first came dangerously close to his head. If we didn't have to get back to the village, I swear. She muttered. Old hag my ass, brat. Sleep, we leave at first light. She turned, leaving with a frazzled shizun. Angel and the pig jumped onto the bed, both amused at the scene. Despite Tsunade's orders, Naruto was not ready to sleep. He was used to healing while traveling back, and he wanted to run to Konoha and Hokage-sama. If they pushed, they could be back within a couple of days. However, they clearly weren't heading back until dawn, so Naruto grinned down at his furry feline partner and the pig. So. Who wants to tell me what happened on the other side of the battlefield? Angel's eyes lit up. I kicked human but as always, Naruto. That sound lady didn't stand a chance. And Habiki ripped the arms off that spider guy. Akira. Then tried to set them on fire and wave them around like sticks. On and on Angel continued her report, and Naruto allowed himself to laugh a few times at the descriptions of death. Who knew Shizun was vindictive enough to beat someone to death with a tree branch? Meanwhile, in the forest. Tayuya crawled, her back in shreds. God she just wanted to curl up and die. It would be so easy she could just close her eyes no. She couldn't do that, not when Orochimaru-sama needed her. She could feel his presence nearby. Her curse seal pulsed, guiding her to her master. Taiyuya could do this, she could carry him away to safety, maybe use his arm tattoos to summon a snake. She would be rewarded, surely. After all, Taiyuya was the last of the Sound Five, the remains of all but Kimimaro who was literally on death's door before this mission, were scattered throughout the forest. Sakan and Yukon, bodies torn apart, Sakan beaten to death by that bitch Shizun. Kadamaru, ripped limb from limb. Fat ass. Well, she never liked him anyway, so him dying before the battle even started just made her smile. Hisses. Teya. There. Orochimaru's voice. It was smaller, and her stomach flipped in dread. Something told her to turn back, to not pull herself any closer to where his body must be. But she couldn't stop, her loyalty making her continue toward a bush. Oh Orochimaru-sama, Taiyuya said. A figure rose from the bushes, and her heart stopped. This wasn't Orochimaru, this was, ah, uh, Taiyuya, hisses. Well done, hiss. A snake with Orochimaru's face rose up, grinning as much as a snake could. Fuck. Fuck no. Her dirty mouth had been born from a life of poverty, and it showed up more when she felt threatened. Now more than ever, Taiyuya was scared. Scared shitless, if she said so herself. Yes. You will do. The snake suddenly lunged, mouth unhinging. 
Taiyuya's screams were the last ones she heard before everything went dark, forever. At least she could brag she was the last to die when she saw her team in the afterlife, right? Finally, with Hikaru. They had arrived at the last base they could find, quickly cleaning out the stragglers. Hikaru interrogated the Otonin with a viciousness not many were aware he possessed. His team was exhausted, having barely escaped the daimyo's palace alive, and the country was on a manhunt for their hides. Hikaru had already sent word to Dragon Sama that the real daimyo could be moved back, if another Kanoha force took out the last of the coup holding up in the palace. God, Hikaru hoped his squad wouldn't be the ones on that mission. Besides, if the screaming scientist below him was telling the truth, they had bigger issues to deal with. The Uchiha trader and Kisame Hashigaki were spotted thirty miles north, headed towards the Kanoha border. Move out, he ordered, Hannah slicing the scientist's throat. She snarled. We won't make it before the bastard does, Captain. Hannah said, and sniffed the air. I know. His. Temporary team was silent, waiting for their order. While all of them knew what had to be done, none of them wanted to do it. Captain? Their resident Aburaim had a scout bug on his finger. The Uchiha is due to cross the border in three hours, if we wish to intersect them. Hikaru sighed, and prayed he would get out of there alive. He hadn't annoyed Daidara enough, and Naruto wasn't fully convinced Hikaru was awesome. But, duty calls. Okay. Time to go kick some Uchiha ass. He said with false cheer. I haven't proven that a Hyuga was better than a competent Uchiha since I was in the academy. Activating his Byakugan, Hikaru led his team to their hardest battle yet. Kanoha, Ichiraka Ramen Stand, Knight. Tuchi grinned at daughter, his mind going to all the money they were pulling in. With all the younger shinobi staying out late to help with the reconstruction and thus not wanting to cook, Ichiraku Ramen was making a gigantic profit. At this rate he could expand by next year. Another order. Five bowls, old man. Hey, Tuchi. Gimme more soup. On and on he filled their orders, I am helping. If only Naruto was here in the village. Then, Tuchi would be a millionaire with how much that boy ate. Hours pass, and the shop emptied. Tuchi stretched as they closed up, thankful for another successful day. Ayam had left an hour ago, him not wanting her up this late. Now time for Tuchi's favorite part of the evening, watching stars as he walked, thinking about the money he raked in and the stupidity of his customers. Just as he was pulling his cover down with a wincing pain in his shoulder, an ominous feeling jolted down his spine. Oh, bother, he said, whipping out his apron to slap away intruders. If this was another prank by Kanoamaru, Tuchi was going to show the brat why his name meant, killing one with bare hands, as well as, making noodles with bare hands. Screams echoed down the quiet street, and fog filled the air. If not for the fact Tuchi had lived through wars, he would have ran for cover. Another invasion? Why, was one this month not good enough? Are they wanting to go back to the days of, an invasion a day keeps the boredom away? Honestly. I just wanted to stargaze on my way to Iam. Tuchi started walking home, figuring he would get home before whatever was attacking got done with the useless Chunin guards. That is, until three of said Chunin guards dropped in a heap at his feet. A low chuckle echoed from everywhere. The Chunin started crying, and when they saw him cowered at his feet. Save us. We don't want to die. The demon's out to get us. Tuchi facebombed and understood instantly what was happening. No, not an invasion, at least those led to more customers, but rather a very bored ANBU commander. Hiruzen had warned Tuchi about him. Oh, for Raman's sake. He bellowed at the cowards. Dragon, leave these morons alone and let up on the fog or I swear I will tell Hiruzen about this when he visits. Next. That seemed to jolt the youngster out of his evil chuckling. The fog let up slightly, 
and a dark figure flickered into existence behind the three chunin. The figure, clearly the commander, picked the trio up by their jackets and vanished once more, leaving Tucci to go stargazing on his way home. Honestly. Youngsters these days, not appreciating the beauty of nature enough, always wanting to play God with fog and wind. Good thing Tucci was smart enough to become a ramen chef. You don't see ramen chefs playing dress up and ruining a great stargazing night. With that, Tucci ambled home, content with his life. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to like and subscribe, and don't forget to share this video with your friends. Guys, make sure to help the author by visiting the link in the description. This is Fox Sage, and I'm signing off.